Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Wellbe Show and Podcast. I am Adrienne Nolan Smith. I am your host. I am thrilled to have Abby Tai, who is a holistic registered nutritionist, um, as well as the founder of Eczema Conquerors, with us today. Um, as you might imagine, we're going to be talking a lot about eczema and this episode. And um, obviously, Abby went through an experience like so many of us that led her to go into this work and specifically to focus on eczema. I decided to have her on the show and to dedicate a whole episode to this topic because of many friends who both have small babies and who have children or themselves are dealing with eczema. And I think there's so many misconceptions and there's just a lot of misinformation about what to do about eczema, where it comes from, what relates to it, you know, what, what the flares mean. I mean, it just, it was really surprising to me how many things I thought people just knew and they, they really didn't. And how many things I thought doctors at this point just knew based on research I had read and they really didn't. So I thought it was really great to have somebody who's dedicated her work to this topic to kind of maybe dispel some of those myths and help us to understand what is the latest research around eczema and what's it saying about, you know, the root causes of it and the best ways to holistically treat it and really resolve it. And then in addition to, you know, make sure that people recognize the differences between eczema and different skin conditions and so on. So Abby, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Adrian, for having me. I really appreciate it. And I'm so happy to be here. Wonderful. I'm thrilled to have you. Okay. So first of all, what led you to found Eczema Conquerors? Obviously, it must have been something pretty, I don't want to say traumatic, but pretty profound as far as life experience. Yes. And uh, I went through really severe eczema. And um, I know some people pronounce it as eczema. Some people pronounce it as eczema. I know a lot of Canadians tend to pronounce it as eczema. So if you hear me pronouncing it differently, that might be why, but it's uh, both work. And um, I went through it really severely, uh, even as a kid. And it took away a lot of moments in my life. Um, I had a lot of trauma from it. And because of that, uh, I once made a promise that if I ever healed, I would share my story with as many people around the world and help as many people as I could to overcome this and not have to suffer like I did. Well, that's beautiful and a, a wonderful motivation. So the way you just said that leads me to believe that you did overcome it. And as far as I can see from you know just your face, you have great skin. So, so please share how you overcame it. Sure. Yeah. So it's definitely been a very up and down journey. There's been a lot of moments where I felt like a disabled person and I, I would classify myself as uh, having been disabled because of it, which is really strange. You would never think of having a skin condition as something that could actually disable you. But um, it's possible that uh, when it gets so severe that everything just becomes so painful. And so my story starts when um, my mom always said that I had it as a, a baby and I had it very mild. But as a teenager, I moved back to Asia and I lived in Hong Kong. And I just remember my mom saying that when I uh, moved there, things would get a lot better. And sadly, it was the other way around where it actually got a little bit worse and it wasn't terrible. It was still manageable, but it wasn't until I was about 15 years old and my first boyfriend broke up with me. And when that happened, he was my first love. And I just remember that feeling where my heart just shattered and it felt awful being dumped at that age and just feeling like your whole world ended. And so that's how I felt. And I just remember things being so difficult and painful. And um, I think I just released so much anger and stress and onto my skin. And from that moment on, my whole entire body became 95% covered in eczema from head to toe. Pretty much every part was covered except for my nose and under my feet as well. And that is a moment when I felt like eczema started to take away my life and it stole so many moments away from me. I remember when it was painful to move, to walk, to sleep, taking a shower stung, uh, washing my face stung. 
I remember my parents would have to help me vacuum my sheets and also the floor every day. And I would just be bleeding a lot. And I tried to hide it, but the weather in Hong Kong was so hot that even if I wore a sweater and um, we wore uniforms, so I had to show my legs. And I just remember not being able to hide it very well. And I missed a lot of school and teachers even asked me if I wanted to move my exams because of it. And so I just remember coming home crying every day and, and just being really suicidal and asking God to end my life because it was just so terrible. And um, now I realize there was a purpose for going through it. I, I moved back to Canada uh, for university and my skin started to clear up naturally uh, because the environment there was, was better for my skin. But as I got older, for some strange reason, um, my skin started to flare again and it had never flared before in Canada. And the, the strange thing was that um, I could no longer just pick up and move like I did before to use that as a way to heal. And so I really had to find alternative ways to heal and to get better. And it was, it was hard. It was painful. One thing that I did find um, was that when I started to change my diet a lot, my skin actually got a lot better. And at one point, I remember it was so scary, so traumatic that there were times when uh, even makeup couldn't cover the texture of my skin. And even if I took a bath, there would be all these dead skin flakes just surrounding the bathtub. And it was, it was gross. And um, yeah, it, it was, it was really tough. And I remember my naturopath once said that it took him two months just to see what my normal face looked like. It was just very disfigured and I felt very disabled. I soon realized that nutrition was really able to help my skin get better and also digging into the root cause. And long story short, uh, my skin started getting a lot better, even though I, I did have some flare-ups after giving birth. But yeah, thankfully, uh, I really believe that there's a way to heal and to get better. And so that's what I'm here to bring that hope and uh, help encourage your listeners that it's possible to reverse this and to get better as well. Well, thank you for sharing that incredibly tough story. I mean, I obviously didn't know the extent of your journey and your disease, and it sounds horrific, um, but I'm glad there's a happy ending. Could you share with us what exactly is eczema and how is it different from psoriasis? Yeah, definitely. So eczema is characterized by itchy, red, inflamed skin. It can also become really uh, dry and flaky at times as well, and often it presents itself as rashes, uh, usually inside our elbows and also behind our knees, but it can actually happen anywhere as well. For some people who have it really severely, it can be all over the body, but for others, it can be on the scalp or the face as well. And psoriasis is different because it is actually um, due to the skin cell uh, turnover happening too fast. Uh, so our skin cells usually turn over every 30 days, but in terms of psoriasis, it happens a lot quicker. Uh, it can happen every three to four days. The skin cells build up really quickly and it, it can become flaky. And so the comorbidities that can come with each of them uh, with eczema and psoriasis are also different as well. For example, psoriasis can come with uh, issues with arthritis and uh, liver issues as well. But um, with eczema, there can be other issues such as heart issues uh, as well in the future. Uh, I think there were studies that showed that it was linked to high rates of heart disease. Um, but yeah, those are things that we definitely want to manage and uh, really get to the root cause so that we don't experience those. You know, you talked about the connection between food and gut issues. And I saw a 2018 study that was in the, the PLOS Journal of Medicine about how maternal probiotic and fish oil supplementation reduced the risk of eczema and food allergies in babies when their mothers were, you know, pregnant um, and taking the probiotics and the fish oil. And so like, I know a lot about the gut microbiome. It's a big focus of the WellBe podcast and just how, you know, your microbiome affects all these different things. But we know now, I mean, skin issues, right, are are very linked to the gut. And so it made sense to me when I saw this article, they're like, oh yeah, of course, like, you know, you're, you're going to have that because um, there's a connection there, but really what is the main connection between how food and gut issues affect your skin? Like what, what is physically happening for that to occur? If you're eating, let's say 
you know, a diet that's mostly fast food. Yeah, actually, before I jump into that, Adrian, I also wanted to point out another interesting study that came out that showed that when mothers who are pregnant use a lot of disinfectant, they actually had higher rates of eczema in their babies as well. So there's definitely that link with the gut microbiome. Right. And so, I mean, for anybody that isn't clear on what that connection is, the disinfectant would be uh, wiping off the good bacteria on your skin microbiome because your skin has a microbiome, your gut has a microbiome, and then also your mouth has a microbiome. And so people that use disinfectant on the skin, right, that's changing that microbiome and therefore the bacterial balance gets out of whack and it looks like it can lead to eczema. So tell me about, you know, what exactly is going on if there's a person who, you know, eats a ton of fast food and then ends up with eczema? Like what, how does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. So first of all, not everyone will notice a difference on their skin if they're eating fast food. I like to call the bucket theory of inflammation where everyone has a different bucket load and everyone can handle a different load of um, uh, inflammation in their body. And what we found is that the more uh, someone is showing symptoms on their skin, the more that their bucket has overflowed. So if you picture a bucket, whenever we add on more things to it, like toxins, medications, inflammatory foods, um, things like antibiotics, things that disrupt the gut microbiome, we start to fill that bucket. And once we get to the top, when it starts to overflow, that's when we see the symptoms happen. And so some people can tolerate junk food, they can tolerate uh, processed foods, and they might not have a lot of eczema symptoms, whereas someone may have a bucket that's overflowing more. And so even if they just eat a little bit of junk food and a little bit of processed food, their body can't tolerate it and they can flare up right away. And so that looks different for each person. Other people we found might even have, for example, things like a leaky gut, where if they eat certain foods, or, or if they're not even digesting it well, or the, if they have issues where, with the low stomach acid, we find that that all comes into play and eating junk food and processed and inflammatory foods can make that even worse. And so when they eat that, if they're not digesting foods properly, it can travel through leaky gut into the bloodstream and cause reactions that way. And so there's multiple things that are happening when, when someone does eat inflammatory foods or junk foods. Got it. Okay. Yeah. The concept of a toxic bucket or a toxic burden is something we talk about a lot on the Wellbe podcast too. So I like that analogy because, you know, when you, for example, like uh, personal care products, right? People are like, okay, I told you I have constipation and, you know, migraines and depression, and you're telling me I have to change my shampoo. Like what? what are you talking about? And I'm like, it's all part of the bucket because your body doesn't really differentiate right between a hamburger, a stressful thought, a toxic shampoo and like mold in your house, right? It's just all coming in as, as toxins and contributing to this bucket and whether or not it overflows. And so it seems like eczema and some of these other skin conditions are one of the ways that that can manifest. It's like one of the symptoms of this bucket overflowing. So it's an inflammatory condition. So we just mentioned a few of them, but obviously, you know, a lot more about eczema specifically than I do. So would you elaborate on what the possible root causes of eczema are that doctors don't always look at or recognize or tell patients about? Yeah, so I love this because this is what I'm passionate about. And this is something that we're constantly digging into with our clients, because what we find is that um, we do a lot of calls with clients. And one thing that we hear on call after call is that they are so tired of their doctor just giving them medication after medication, and they find that it's not going anywhere. And they really want another solution. They want a better way. And one of the things that we have found is that a lot of doctors give topical creams or even oral medications. We find that that tends to be more of a band-aid approach. It tends to suppress the issues and the symptoms, but it doesn't really get to the root of what's happening. 
it tends to be a outside in approach. And so our goal is to really take an inside out approach and look at what some of these root causes can be. Like you mentioned, there can be up to 15 to 16 different root causes. Um, anything like uh, overgrowth of bacteria, fungal overgrowth, yeast overgrowth, candida, parasites, heavy metals. Um, we've even found that even with things like adrenal fatigue or uh, thyroid issues can also affect the skin as well. Nutrient deficiencies, molds, hormonal imbalances. And so there's a really wide range of things that can really cause the skin to flare. And we find that not everyone has all 15 to 16 of these root causes. It's usually a combination of them, for example, three to four or four to five of them. But at the root of it, it, we've even found that poor digestion and even things like low stomach acid, that also comes into play and affects the skin a lot as well. Got it. Wow. That is a lot of different ones. And I feel like there's the bad bugs, the bad microbes piece of it to me is so, so unknown. Like yes. so few people think like, oh, I have fungus, I have a parasite and that's what's on my coming, you know, making my skin react this way. It's just so interesting how few doctors really make that connection. Yeah. And also, I just want to share something interesting is that we're starting to find that dental issues are affecting the skin as well, because 45% of your oral bacteria overlaps with your uh, bacteria in your gut. And so whenever there's issues in our mouth, that can also start to affect our gut and our skin as well. I've interviewed some biological dentists who have shared that even just removing root canals or infected teeth or even bacteria in the teeth, even that they've seen some of their patients have their skin or their eczema clear up in some cases within a week of removing those uh, infected teeth. Wow, or even the within teeth a bacteria. week. That's yeah. so powerful. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you saw, but I just put out an episode of the podcast that was with um, Hannah Bronfman, who's like a sort of social media influencer, fitness, wellness. And she told the story of having infertility and some other kind of like chronic fatigue type symptoms and finding out that a bike accident that had knocked her teeth out and then she'd had to have some implants and things done in a surgery, there had been a chronic infection as a result. And so she had the infections cleaned out and was able to get pregnant like a couple of months later. So that's amazing. Um, yeah, I saw was, you posted that. Yeah. So I'm ama- I mean, not amazed, but the more I hear, it seems like it's coming at me from every direction, especially what you just said. Cause I I knew that inherently from what she was explaining, that of course, like if there's a bacterial imbalance anywhere in your body, it could cause skin issues. But now just this awareness of like these chronic infections being linked to infertility and perhaps skin disorders. It's, it's just makes you really never want to have any sort of dental surgery because there just could be a lingering infection that, yes, exactly. You know, and it's very hard and very expensive to, to undo. So, or to get rid of, to get cleaned out. So beyond that, you mentioned something to me before we started this interview that I thought was very interesting. There's a connection between suicide and eczema. And of course, you shared your own story of having, you know, suicidal ideations. But will you tell us, I know there's some research related to it. So what what is that? What's the connection? Because I feel like it plays into this whole uh, microbiome thing in some way. Yeah, some interesting facts that I wanted to share about depression are that children and adolescents with eczema are two to six times more likely to have depression and anxiety compared to children without it. And also adults who have eczema are two and a half to three times more at risk for anxiety and depression as well. And there's also studies that show that people with eczema are 44% more likely to exhibit thoughts about suicide and 36% more likely to attempt suicide as well. So those are very scary stats that tend to be higher than um, the regular population who doesn't uh, have this condition. Right. And so the connection, I'm sure, you know, you can explain it better than I can, but I would assume the fact that we know that there's a gut brain access, right? There's something called the vagus nerve and it connects the gut microbiome and the brain. 
and it's bi-directional. So the gut is sending messages to the brain. If there's bad microbes, it can cause things like thoughts of depression and anxiety, but the other way around as well. So if you have very stressful thoughts, it'll cause some gut symptoms sometimes, constipation, uh, leaky gut, uh, things like that, or contribute to, I should say. Um, so is that really the connection to the suicidal ideations that the studies were aware of, or they were just saying there was a connection and they didn't really explore it further? I think that it's multifactorial. What you mentioned comes into play, especially when uh, so many of us are walking around with guts that are um, not in optimal shape, especially because of either the food that we're eating or just some of the root causes I shared about earlier, uh, different pathogens, hidden infections. Those can all affect our gut, but also our mood and uh, really uh, affect depression and suicidal thoughts as well. But also just having eczema in general, having eczema is like, it's, it's so tough because when you have it, sometimes when you look at your face in the mirror, or at least this has happened to myself, um, just waking up and seeing new rashes on your face, it gets scary to look in the mirror sometimes. Uh, it lowers your self-esteem. It lowers your confidence. There's been times I felt like I was really disfigured. And so even just meeting people, uh, meeting friends, meeting family, that embarrassment and shame and judgment comes along with it. I also want to add that there have been studies that show that oral steroids, which are given to a lot of people who have eczema, um, they're actually linked to different side effects. So not only are they linked to uh, side effects like insomnia, depression, uh, anxiety, but they're also linked to other side effects that are not talked about very much and doctors don't share about a lot as well. They're linked to other things like suicidal thoughts and also homicidal thoughts as well. And so I interviewed a dermatologist and he shared that he actually tries to avoid giving oral steroids as much as possible because in a few of his patients, he has noticed that um, they can become homicidal and suicidal. He has one patient where uh, if his patient takes the, uh, the oral steroids, um, she has to ask her kid and her husband to leave the house um, just because of some of those fears. And there has been on the news, there has been um, one case where a girl committed suicide and also unfortunately murdered her parents as well. And um, yeah, the, uh, he, uh, when I interviewed that dermatologist, he mentioned that it is possible that it could be due to the oral steroids. And um, uh, the scary thing is that a lot of uh, doctors are still giving out oral steroids um, without sharing the side effects. So uh, I remember when I did share this, um, not a lot of people had heard about it or knew about it. But another uh, side effect as well that I wanted to share is that there's also something called steroid-induced dementia. And so um, basically, some of the symptoms of dementia can come up when steroids are taken. But there's been research that shows that it tends to go back to normal after the steroids are removed. So yeah, lots of factors that come into play when it affects depression and suicidal thoughts. That is so crazy. I had no idea that oral steroids, which yes, that's very much given today still to uh, people with this condition and babies and toddlers and children and adults, of course, too, but was linked to, you know, suicidal ideations and, and homicidal ideations. That's just terrifying. I mean, gosh, the number of people on these things, and then you just think about the potential for murder. I mean, it's just, it's just terrifying. Mm -hmm. On the topic of steroids, there are also topical steroids, right? Yes. And um, there's a lot of side effects as well from topical steroids. I know that. Will you share some of those as well? And also just talk about in general, you know, what a topical solution for eczema like does and why it doesn't actually sort of solve the problem for, for good. It just kind of like covers it up. Sure. So there's something that's starting to happen that a lot of people are noticing. And there's a big community on social media uh, with people who are coming out and sharing their experiences with this. And there's something called topical steroid withdrawal, which is basically when people have used steroids for some time and they find that when they come off of it, there's actually a rebound effect and their skin gets so much worse than when they started. For some people, it's leaving them uh, disabled. For some people, it's leaving them bedridden. They're not able to leave their house. Um, I have a friend who uh, went through a divorce because of it. 
And there's just so many side effects that are coming along with it. And more and more doctors are starting to realize it and recognize it, but still uh, the majority of doctors um, around the world don't really acknowledge it. And there's actually uh, an organization called ITSAN, and they're trying to uh, make this, they're trying to bring awareness and actually make this a formal diagnosis that topical steroid withdrawal does exist. And a lot of people are going through it. Um, There's actually celebrities going through it as well. And so it's not easy. And um, the difference between topical steroid withdrawal and eczema is that there can be a lot more side effects that come along with it, not just the physical symptoms of having it on your skin, but it can also come with things like um, feeling chills or even sweats, uh, feeling like ants are crawling in your skin. And so just a lot of symptoms like that. Also symptoms of feeling uh, uh, what we call zingers, where it feels like you're being electrocuted or zapped. So it's really, really uncomfortable and just it's so difficult to live with. So what we're finding is that these topical solutions are not always working. Uh, but it's not just steroids that it's limited to. Also, other uh, topical creams like Protopic and Eladel, those that are given can also create withdrawal symptoms that people are starting to experience. And there's also Facebook groups dedicated to it where people are sharing their experiences on this. It's just so unfortunate to see just so many people going through withdrawal. Sometimes uh, for people who are waiting it out, I've noticed that if they are not actively doing something to really get to the root cause, whether their root cause is hidden infections or pathogens or, or doing something to help with their gut health, I notice that they tend to go through it longer. And some of them even go through, they like to call it like a three-year anniversary, four-year anniversary, or even five-year anniversary of topical steroid withdrawal. And so Um, Yeah, it's tough to see so many people going through this. I will say, I think it's worth us explaining, um, you know, just simply how steroids work and why there would be this kind of withdrawal. Because I think sometimes not even patients with skin issues understand fully what they're getting. They think they're getting medicine when they get a prescription, but they don't really understand like how steroids work. So could you just give a quick explanation? Yeah, so basically when we put steroids on the body, um, they help to reduce some of the inflammation that's caused by the cells. And so um, because it helps to lower the inflammation, it really helps to suppress what's happening. But because it's suppressing what's happening, it's suppressing the issues and it becomes a Band-Aid and it's not really getting to the root cause. So the more that we're suppressing it, the uh, there's a saying, when you treat something externally, you will forever be treating it eternally. Got it. And I think it's important to mention that when you say it helps to, you know, bring down the inflammation, how it's doing that is the inflammation is coming from your body's own immune system reacting to a problem, right? And so it's overreacting, you know, in this way and and causing this, this symptom. And so what a steroid does is it, it like zaps your immune system, it neutralizes it so it can't work. And when it can't work, then it won't create the symptoms of skin issues or autoimmunity and things like that. So if you think about that for one second, as any kind of logical human, you want your immune system to work. And so when it's not working properly, there's a reason why, and we need to figure out that reason why, and then help it to get you know back to a good place. Versus when you use a steroid, you're basically, you know, blowing up your own immune system temporarily um, so that it's not giving the cry for help in the symptom of eczema. Besides the horrific side effects and withdrawal symptoms that you mentioned, it's such a disservice that I think a lot of doctors are doing when they give somebody a steroid, whether it's topical or oral, without explaining how that works. Um, and how people's own immune systems are being, you know, shot down and compromised by using these things for a long period of time, or even just temporarily, but then again, temporarily, and again, and again, and going on a pattern like that for, you know, decades sometimes. So I'm glad we were able to kind of flush that out for people, because I think 
there's a lot of confusion around that. And also, I once heard someone describe it really well um, in the sense that they described it as uh, putting a steroid is basically uh, because you're putting a corticosteroid and cortisol, uh, which is similar to um, the hormone that the adrenal glands produce. It, it's kind of like your body becomes so dependent on it. And it, it's almost like uh, let's say like if you had a bank that kept giving you money for years and years and um, you didn't have to work for it. And so you would become so dependent on it. And um, in the same way, it's kind of like you're getting all this cortisol for, for so long. And then once you remove it, your body becomes dependent. And so our adrenal glands can be affected by it too. And a lot of people can experience adrenal fatigue. So it, it's tough. A lot of uh, side effects that come along with it. Yes. And your adrenals are very connected to your thyroid function. So it's, it's a, you know, as somebody that has thyroid issues, um, I learned a lot about the connection, but you know, your adrenals really tell your thyroid what to do. And your thyroid is the engine for your whole body. So if you're taking a drug that affects your adrenals, and then you might then have thyroid problems as a result. So you could follow the trail to figure some things out that might be going on. If you have both eczema and are taking steroids and you have thyroid problems, for example, or adrenal fatigue or both. I have another question for you. Why does eczema seem to come and go? Because I have friends that have it or whose children have it. And it seems like they're always about to maybe try to figure out the root cause and do the real digging, but then it kind of goes away for a while. And then they lose motivation to really figure it out because it seems to be going away. And then maybe it comes back for a flare or you know, kind of doesn't, and maybe is it possible to kind of grow out of it or something? So how does that work? Yeah, it's, it's possible to grow out of it. Um, we have seen people who have, but just because someone doesn't experience the symptoms showing up on their skin doesn't mean that the issue went away inside of their, whether it's in their gut or what, or what their root issue was. Um, sometimes symptoms come and go. It doesn't always uh, show up on the skin. Um, it's just, it's interesting. I feel like the body is very interesting at communicating and sometimes it's more silent and sometimes it's, it's better at hiding and sometimes it's better at showing it. Um, other factors come into play as well, I feel like. For example, um, climate, like when people are on vacation and they're next to the beach, I hear a lot of people say that their skin tends to get better. And then when they come back, they feel like their skin gets worse. Or even if people go through a stressful time in their life, they feel like it gets a lot worse. And then uh, they feel like when they get over it, their skin tends to get better. But I've also met someone who mentioned that when she got out of a relationship that she was in, her skin actually improved a lot. And it, it was probably a stressful relationship for her. And um, I've also heard the opposite where it's gotten worse when, they're, when they came out of a relationship. So one of the biggest struggles that eczema sufferers get is that um, a lot of us, myself included, we become really paranoid whenever the flare-ups show. We try to figure out, was it this that caused it? Was it that? Was it something I ate? Was it the environment? Was it something I did? Was it because I didn't do a certain thing? I didn't exercise, things like that. And a lot of factors come into play, um, especially because our body is a holistic uh, system that works together. So even our lymphatic system, when it's not working optimally, that affects our skin. And so it's not just the gut, but it's um, everything like you, that you mentioned, the liver, the adrenal uh, glands, the thyroid. Um, even I have some thyroid symptoms as well, which uh, I have to constantly work on as well because that affects my skin too. And so, yeah, everything comes into play. And um, yeah, definitely some people find that their skin comes and goes, whereas some people find that they constantly have those symptoms screaming and shouting at them. But one thing I would encourage people to do is that even if you find that it's not bothering you as much or that it comes and goes, is to really still dig deep because why is that happening and why does that keep happening? There's a reason that that's happening and uh, topical solutions alone are usually not enough to get to the bottom of it. Right. Yeah. Like something that's coming and going is still coming back again. Right. So we want to understand why that's happening, even if so I, I, I imagine some people want to think, oh, well, it went away. My body must be doing better instead of like, okay, why does it keep coming back? I should figure that part out. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I strongly encourage anybody dealing with skin issues to dig deep because like Abby just said, they are so connected to you know the way that your body detoxifies through your lymph 
and how your organs work and you know, certainly infections and toxins uh, that affect the microbiome. It's just, it's really miraculous when you keep going back to it. And for so many years, we've thought of it as a skin condition that stays on the skin, right? Always treating it from the outside in. Always, you know, I same with acne. I think um, so many people I know always were doing these very complicated, um, you know, skincare rituals for acne and this and that. And, and nobody knew in, you know, high school, when I was in high school or college or even after that, that that was, I, would, I don't want to say for nothing, but that the main root of the problem was, you know, coming from the inside and they could spend a lot of money and on products, but it was going to keep coming, you know, from, from things that were going on. So thanks to people like you, there's awareness on a more and more mainstream level, but certainly you have a lot more work to do on that. <laughs> yeah. My, my goal is to spread more awareness about yeah, really digging sure. deep. It really um, is needed. I think just from some of the people that I know were, you know, smart and open, but they're just not being told the things that you're talking about. So have you seen eczema be fully reversed ever? Yeah, I have seen people who have found that their skin has definitely cleared up a lot. And I really believe that it is possible to reverse a lot of things that are happening. Um, I've even found that when the skin gets better, uh, we're also all able to tolerate a lot more foods. Um, like for example, at one point, my skin was so flared up and so red, so inflamed, just going through so, so many uh, issues. And I remember the moment I ate the wrong food, I would uh, the moment I put it into my mouth, it touched my tongue, my tongue would tingle, my fingers would tingle. And thankfully, a lot of that has reversed. Um, at one point, I couldn't even tolerate eating meat, uh, I would just flare even fats, we find that a lot of uh, people with eczema can't tolerate fats as well, like, um, even things like coconut oil, their, their face can start flaring, or other parts of their body can start flaring. And so there's a lot of linkage between digestion and our skin. Yeah, so I, I really believe that um, it can be reversed and I'm able to eat a lot more foods that I couldn't eat in the past as well. You know, my husband just had a case of food poisoning and um, he had basically gotten over it. And then we had a family dinner with some really nice organic grass-fed steaks and he thought he was fine to eat normally again because he had been eating, you know, crackers and water basically for, for a couple of days. And he had a full relapse into how sick he'd been with the food poisoning. And he was able to talk to a doctor about it. And, you know, the doctor mentioned that our microbiomes, our digestive bacteria that break down all of our food, there's certain levels and that, you know, sort of um, fats, especially are, like a deeper level of digestion that the microbiome and all of our good bacteria have to break down. And it's harder for them to do that. So as you're saying this, I'm thinking about it and I'm assuming, you know, that people with skin issues, especially eczema probably don't have enough good gut bacteria, right? So if fats are harder for our good gut bacteria to break down, that kind of makes sense to me, right? That fats would be a challenge because they're already compromised or challenged, hence the skin mm -hmm. symptoms. Um, so of course, like fats would be a yeah. challenge for digestion. And, and also one thing we found is that um, uh, we do uh, gut tests and stool tests as well. And what we found is that when there is low stomach acid, it also tends to let more bacteria in, especially mm -hmm. because we need enough stomach acid to kill the bacteria and pathogens in. So we tend to see that overgrowth of bacteria, um, more pathogens. And um, yeah, we're also not able to digest fats as well. And, and even sometimes our digestion is wonky in general. And so... I feel like there's definitely a, a lot that we have to work on, not just with digestion, but just pathogens, hidden infections as a whole, uh, just so much to dig deep into. Yeah. And one thing that you mentioned before we wrap up that I want to circle back to that we didn't talk that much about um, that is important are just environmental toxins because they contribute to that toxic bucket. And so if you do have a pathogen, let's say um, candida, and your body is really compromised and struggling because a lot of your toxic bucket is filled up with, you know, mold and metals in the water and the air or some chemicals from a power plant that's, 
you know, uh, near your house or you live near a highway. So you're, you know, breathing all of those toxic fumes in, then it's distracted, right? Your body's not able to mount a good offensive against the candida fungus. It's compromised and dealing with all of these other things that are filling up the toxic bucket. So that's to me, one thing that people are like, well, how can like mold in my house that I'm living in cause these skin issues if they're supposed to come from the inside, right? Cause they're thinking like, oh, it's touching the skin, but it's like, no, that's kind of the, the circle, right. Of how it all comes together. Exactly. Yeah. So many uh, environmental toxins that we don't see, and um, even like you mentioned, pollution, uh, we, we found that uh, living in urban cities tends to have higher prevalence of eczema versus living in rural cities. Right. And so, um, yeah, it, it's uh, everything comes into play and it's very interesting how it can affect the skin as a whole. Right. So interesting. I lived in China actually three different times in my life and uh, Beijing, Shanghai and Hong Kong. That's and amazing. all of them had pollution issues, but Beijing was the worst uh, as far when I lived there, it was uh, the year 2000 and my skin, I mean, just from, I think the, the soot, you know, a lot of coal was being burned, just, it felt off. And I think, you know, there's, there's an internal component to toxins in the air, right. As I, which I was just talking about, they, they come in, they contribute to your toxic load or your toxic bucket, which affects your, you know, microbiome being able to do its work, blah, blah, blah. But there's also just like a, it's coming in through your skin yes, exactly. and harming your skin microbiome, which is its own thing. Certainly I noticed that when I was there. Uh, and I'm sure that when you then moved back to Hong Kong with your family and you thought it would get better and it got worse, that, that likely played some kind of role. Cause I know Hong Kong has much better pollution than Beijing, but it's still not great. Yeah, and also the water as well. Just one thing that we found is that having a water filter and water softener helps because hard water has actually been linked to higher rates of eczema as well. And so- um, How does that work? How does, what's in the hard water that would- Yeah, so, so because it has those minerals like um, the calcium and um, the other minerals, it, it can actually dry out the skin. And um, okay. we found that uh, after you take a shower, it can take up to six hours for your, your skin's pH levels to balance back to normal. And because of that, it affects the skin barrier. And so getting a water softener can help with that, but also a water filter so that your skin is not the filter for um, <laughs> the water. And um, yeah, uh, also we find that adding in products can help to acidify the skin barrier. Um, to keep bacteria out and reduce inflammation. And um, yeah, the, that can all uh, help the skin mantle um, get better. Interesting. Um, well, this has been so informative. I've really, really enjoyed everything that we're learning um, about this condition and, and also feeling both terrified by some of the things you shared about the current treatments and uh, homicidal ideations and some of these other things, which gosh, like, you know, a teenager fighting this battle like you were and then being put on something that would then create even more of a mental illness impact or just mental health symptoms uh, just seems so wrong to me. But it's you know going to be awareness that changes the, the system and makes it so that you know these other things are being explained and worked on with eczema patients and with doctors and not just, you know, here's a steroid kind of over and over. Abby, thank you so much. Please let us know how to learn more about eczema conquerors and your work. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Adrian, for having me. And uh, you can find me anywhere on social media. I'm on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, all at eczema conquerors. And my website is eczemaconquerors.com. I also have a podcast called the eczema podcast, um, which was the very first uh, podcast out there uh, with six years of information in case you ever want more resources to help your skin get better. Uh, we're here to help you with that as well. Great. That's a great resource. Okay, Abby. Well, thank you again. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And um, good luck with uh, this very hard but 
doable and exciting challenge that you've chosen for your work to spread the word about the real, you know, root causes of eczema and how to really heal. You're doing great work. Thank you so much, Adrian, for having me. It's been so nice connecting with you here and sharing information to help others. You're so welcome. Bye, Abby. Bye.